Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Gwent police say they will not be reopening the investigation into the Jeremy Thorpe scandal after closing down an inquiry last year into allegations of an attempt to murder the former Liberal leader's ex-gay lover, Norman Scott. Officers have now spoken to the alleged hitman, Andrew Newton, after discovering he was not dead, as they had assumed, and say he didn't shed any new light. Kami and Zerum went on the trail too. Jeremy Thorpe, and a very English scandal indeed. Headline news again, following this popular BBC drama about the infamous gay politician. Oh my God, it's you. The bungled hit on Thorpe's secret lover one rainy night on X. Oh. The dog that was shot instead, and the search for the hitman. The target, Norman Scott, who Thorpe feared would bring his career crashing to an end. 40 years later, Scott is still asking the same question. Why has the man sent to kill him never been found? Scott made a documentary about all this with Panorama decades ago, but it was never broadcast until he repeated his demands for answers again last night. The truth hasn't come out. It's, it is a conspiracy to murder me, and it won't seem to go away, and I have to see it through. 1979, the so-called trial of the century. Jeremy Thorpe, former leader of the Liberal Party, accused of conspiracy to murder his former lover. Thorpe was sensationally acquitted amid claims of establishment cover-up. Thorpe died in 2014, and in 2016, police began a new investigation. Who was the alleged hitman? Let's start with previous suspects and Andrew Newton, the man with the gun convicted of shooting Thorpe's lover's dog that night long ago on the moors. But police shelved their new inquiry within months because they thought Newton was dead. Well, Newton is very much alive, living in the Surrey Hills under the curious pseudonym of Ham Redwin. Just how hard is it to investigate the biggest scandal in British political history? Well, it turns out there's this thing called the internet, and a simple search points to a man frequently seen visiting the house behind me in leafy Surrey, where police eventually came knocking this weekend. Andrew Newton, a.k.a. Ham Redwin, wasn't here when either we or the police dropped by. But his friend was. And establishment cover-up? He never mentioned one. He must have mentioned it. It's not my story, I'm afraid. Sure. It's... Yeah. Do you think... There was an establishment cover-up. Me? Do you think I was, was... Um, I think I was nursing at the time and I didn't even have a TV, so what would I know? Ask the seasoned Panorama journalist who interviewed Norman Scott, though, and you get this. I have no doubt there was a cover-up. I think it involved the police, Scotland Yard, Special Branch and MI5. And I think they did it in what they believed to be were the interests of the nation. Jeremy Thorpe cleared of conspiracy to murder. But who was the hitman who tried to kill his former lover? In the last few moments, police revealed they have now spoken to a Mr. Redwin and he's unable to provide any additional evidence. The case, police say, remains closed. Well, our political correspondent Michael Crick has some juicy details. Well, the talk there of an establishment cover-up, it it's actually uh, seems that ITN, the company we work for, may also have had a, a bit of a, a role in this. In those days, ITN just did the news for ITV, uh, and, uh, of course, now they do Channel 4 News as well. And a former producer for uh, ITN in those days, Stuart Purvis, who later became editor of this programme, tweeted today about how he'd got on to the Norman Scott story quite early on and fixed up an interview with Scott 
only for this to be blocked by the then ITN editor, Nigel Ryan, who apparently told Purvis that he'd known Thorpe a long time and didn't think that Scott's story was at all uh, credible and therefore they weren't going to do anything, uh, anything more on it. Now, I've also learned that around the same time, Nigel Ryan felt rather sorry for Jeremy Thorpe, that he had a lot of bad luck, that essentially he was a good guy, he was bound to lose his parliamentary seat, and Ryan suggested to his colleagues within ITN that the company ought to take Thorpe on as a television reporter, or at least to give him a tryout. Well, as you can imagine, this was met with uh, some opposition by uh, Ryan's uh, senior colleagues, uh, and uh, so that never happened. But... Three years later or so, after the trial, about nine months after the acquittal, uh, News at 10 on ITV did actually employ Jeremy Thorpe for one report interviewing the former Zambian leader Kenneth uh, Kaunda, uh, although it wasn't a long-term arrangement. But I think it does also illustrate the way at the time there were quite a few people who felt that maybe Thorpe wasn't guilty. Thanks, Michael. Well, the former Liberal Party leader, Lord Steele, joins us now from Selkirk. Uh, Lord Steele, at what point did you start to think Jeremy Thorpe was guilty? Well, it was at the, actually nothing to do with the uh, Scott directly. It was when I discovered that he'd used money which had been given for election purposes to buy letters. And uh, that, for me, was the, the closing item when I had to tell him that he ought to go. Uh, and what about the actual alleged conspiracy to, to murder Scott? What was your view on that? Do you think he did it? I have no idea. I mean, it, it now sounds as though, from what Michael Crick's just been saying, as though you and ITN were partly responsible for it. <laughs> but, I mean, because what's curious... We don't curious, know, do we? Well, we, we don't, but uh, may, maybe one day we'll find out. But what's curious is that when you took over as leader after his resignation, um, you still felt he was sufficiently respectable to make him foreign affairs spokesman. I mean, what was your thinking there? No, 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 no. No, that's not true. He didn't was, play any part in... Was he in, not... Was he in, not did uh, he not have a Europe role? Party. He might have had very briefly, but not after the trial, no. No, before the trial. I mean, after his resignation, but before the trial. Well, but in, in those days, you, you know, everybody is innocent until proved guilty, aren't they? So there was no question of, of uh, him being denied any role uh, immediately after he'd resigned as leader. But that didn't last for very long. So at that point, when he resigned, you, what was your view of him? I mean, did you think he was guilty or you just had no view of it? No, no idea any more than you do. Just, just one of those curious scandals? Yeah. I mean, ultimately, I mean, now, with hindsight, do you think it was an establishment cover-up? Well, it, all of the evidence which is now being brought out, in, including what you've just uh, said on the programme, makes it sound quite likely, doesn't it? I mean, uh, Tom Mangold's uh, programme last night was pointing out that it was in the midst of a whole lot of other scandals, and uh, I think the establishment felt that they couldn't afford another one. That, that was the, the thread of what he was saying last night, and there may be something in that. I don't know. It's very difficult to tell. It makes you wonder what else they've covered up, though, doesn't it? And what else they might still be covering up? <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I, I, I think um, th this was a very, very odd case, um, and uh, yeah, it was a one-off. I don't, I don't think you can say that the establishment goes around covering up for people. I don't believe that at all. Even, even though you think he may, they, they may have covered up for this one? Well, it sounds as though they might have, yes. I mean, you know, so many people have now come forward, including just a few minutes ago, uh, people who had connections with Jeremy Thorpe, um, the police, uh, politicians and so on. It's possible. Uh, I, I just don't know. I mean, at the time, uh, we just accepted that he had done wrong internally in the party by, by misappropriating funds, and that was the end of it. Anyone who's watched Hugh Grant over the last couple of weeks, you know, will have formed their own view. I mean, how accurate is the drama? What was he like? Oh, I th well, there are lo there's lots of um, dramatic license in it. A lot of th uh, the details are wrong. But the basic thrust of the thing is probably correct. And I think uh, Hugh Grant's portrayal of Jeremy Thorpe was Remarkable, quite remarkable, quite uncanny, really. Accurate. Accurate, yes. Lord Steele, thank you very much indeed.
It can't uh, just be those of us of a certain age who are fascinated by the Thorpe scandal. For some of us, it, of course, does bring back memories of an engrossing plot in a different age. A plot replete with the phrase, bunnies can and will go to France. But for any generation, it has to be a gripping tale, hence the drama featuring Hugh Grant and the enduring police interest in what happened. We're going to talk to Lord Steele, David Steele, in a moment. He led the Liberal Party after the Thorpe era ended in 1976. But first, here's a quick recap of the event. It was in 1961 that Thorpe began an affair with Norman Scott. Good morning. And a very, very fine morning it is, too. Who was a vulnerable man seeking help. The two had met when Thorpe visited stables where Scott had been working. Problems for Thorpe began to mount over the next few years. Norman Scott was prone to erratic <laughs> behaviour and began to talk about the relationship, including to the police and to Thorpe's mother. Jeremy Thorpe and his close friend Peter Bessel became increasingly concerned about the potential damage Scott could do to Thorpe, now leader of the Liberal Party. Bessel started paying retainers to Scott. It's at the end of 1968 that Peter Bessel claims Thorpe said, we've got to get rid of him, and later, it's no worse than shooting a sick dog. The alleged conspiracy was born. Nothing actually happened to Scott at that stage, yet the problem of his blabbing wouldn't go away. In 1971, he met the then Liberal MP David Steele in the Commons and told him about the affair. The Liberal Party held an inquiry but exonerated Thorpe. Unfortunately for Thorpe, the issue just wouldn't die. By 1974, it's alleged some kind of action to silence Scott was being planned. Thorpe managed to divert £20,000 of a party donation to pay a friend to pay a man with a gun to shut Scott up, the story goes. That culminated in the shooting of Norman Scott's dog in Exmoor, but the gun jammed before Scott himself could be shot. Thereafter, more and more came into the public domain. David Steele told Thorpe to resign after finding out about the diversion of party funds. Thorpe's friend Peter Bessel went public with his story of the conspiracy. At the end of the decade, Thorpe was on trial, although acquitted. He disappeared from public life after that, suffering from Parkinson's, although he made a poignant appearance at the Liberal Democrat Party conference in 1997. Jeremy Thorpe died in 2014. That was a very condensed version uh, of the plot, but it's worth also saying that there's an enduring suspicion the authorities, or the establishment, tried to protect Thorpe and cover up the affair with Norman Scott. And Panorama last night ran an episode put together at the time of the trial, which made the case that a lot more had been known about Thorpe than the authorities let on. Well, let's talk to Lord Steele, who joins us now uh, from Selkirk. A very good evening to you. And I wonder whether you think Thorpe was guilty of a conspiracy to murder Norman Scott. Well, we have to remember, Evan, that 40 years ago, a jury decided that he was not guilty. And those of us who'd worked with him could not do anything else but accept the jury's verdict. I mean, that's, that's uh, the way the system worked. And let me ask you now, because the jury had to find beyond reasonable doubt, let me ask you now, on the balance of probabilities, not beyond reasonable doubt, do you think it was more than 50% that he did engage in that conspiracy? I think that a lot more has come out since the end of the trial. In fact, uh, since he died and Peter Bessel died and David Holmes died, um, and there's a, lo a lot more suggestions in Tom Mangold's uh, documentary yeah. last night, for example, that there might have been a lot of people who wanted to help uh, protect him. I don't know whether that any of that's true or not. It's possible. That's all I can say. Yeah. Well, there is something strange, because what is known and what you know is that Thorpe did have £10,000 on two occasions diverted into a, an associate's account in the Channel Islands, which he funneled off somewhere. And what did you think he was doing with that money? Or what do you now think he was doing with that money if he wasn't sending it off somewhere to pay a hitman? No, I, I, I knew because it's when I discovered that £10,000 had gone missing and had been used because this came out, uh, I think, uh, before the trial. Yeah. I, I was told this had happened. 
and that money had gone to David Holmes to pay to retrieve letters. Um, all of that was true. And that was the reason, it was nothing to do with the conspiracy to murder, it was a question of the misuse of party funds that was the reason that Jeremy had to go as leader. But what did, what did you think he was doing with the money? He wasn't a thief, he wasn't just filing it off to his own bank account to buy a car. What, what did you think he was doing with the money? Or at least when you heard knew, a, a knew, number of people say, on, look, there's a conspiracy. He, I, I, go on. I knew what he was doing with the money. He was buying the letters. Buying the letters, not paying a hitman or anything like that. No, no, no. Uh, there's no suggestion he was using the money for that. Not that I was aware uh, of, anyway. OK. Um, previously, you said you didn't know he was gay or had a homosexual past until really quite late in the whole None process. Us. And that, that seems... None of us knew that. It just seems quite None incredible. Of us knew that. Because we, I mean, we worked with him in the Commons. I mean, it just seems quite incredible because there, there was quite a lot of talk about flamboyance and then some embarrassing moments where he'd been perhaps a little bit too obvious on occasions at the odd party and things like that. And you, you had absolutely no idea whatsoever. None at all. None of, none of us who were colleagues of his in the Commons were aware of this at all. Do you think there was any plan to, any establishment plot to kind of cover up the affair, that just to try and bury it? Well, uh, as I say, last night I, I thought Tom Mangold made quite a good uh, documentary uh, indicating that th the atmosphere at the time was so full of other scandals, the Perfumo affair and others, that there was a, a mood, so, so he alleges, uh, among the establishment to say, well, we don't want another scandal, so let's just uh, help him out. I don't know if that's true, but it's certainly plausible. You only had, in that 74 to 79 Parliament, you had something like 13 MPs. One was Jeremy Thorpe, who a lot of people think conspired to murder someone. Another one was Cyril Smith, who now is widely regarded as having uh, abused a number of young men. I just wonder whether well, you think there was something well, wrong with the party at that stage. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Wait a minute. Be careful what you say about Cyril Smith, because nothing has been proved against him at all. It's all been uh, scurrilous hearsay. And uh, so far, we're waiting for the final outcome of the inquiry. So it's, it's wrong to categorise so him in that so way. So you, 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 you don't think Cyril Smith was guilty of abuse at all at this point? I don't know, but I, I think we have, to, we have to wait till the inquiry has finished its work. I, really, I think it's right to suddenly say that he was uh, just because of tittle-tattle. Right. Um, let me ask you one last question. It's a complete change of subject, if I may, Lord Steele. You were the sponsor of the abortion, um, the, the, the deregulation of the abortion, the, the liberalising abortion laws in the 1960s. It's a big debate now about whether that should apply in Northern Ireland. And there are two principles. One is, in devolution terms, it's up to Northern Ireland, and the other is, in human rights terms, the UK position is that abortion should be legal. I just wonder which, which side of that debate you would come on at this point. Well, of course, in 1967, the law didn't apply to Northern Ireland because Stormont was up and running then. They had their own parliament, and it was a matter for them. There isn't a, a, a parliament functioning in Northern Ireland at the moment, and for that reason, and given particularly after the referendum in the Republic, I think it really is a matter for the UK parliament to decide. So at this point, you think the UK parliament could take that decision because it is the I legitimate authority? Well, like, yeah. I think, I think so, yes. Lord Steele, thank you very much for talking to us. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks. Okay, thank you.